to end all wars by zero option. My name is Lieutenant Nathaniel Dale. Well, your first guess would be that I'm career military, right? Rue Britannia and all of that? Well, nothing could be further from the truth. I was seconded from the Vatican. Drafted, really. The Cardinal made it abundantly clear that this wasn't a request. My expertise would be needed for a king, country, and God, and the soul of civilization. Well, and this is one of my tales. Being quite chuffed at the idea of being sent to war for heaven's sake, I'm a religious scholar, not a military man. Even my family had been all barristers and constabularies, not exactly distinguished combat history for heaven's sake. I've never even fired a gun before. With a deep lump in my stomach, I entered into the war office, and a lovely young receptionist took my orders, told me to wait there, and she'd be right back. I sat down on the wooden bench adjacent to the front desk and patiently waited, and in less than five minutes, a pair of dour MPs asked me to follow them. I was then led through a maze of corridors, stairwells, and endless back paths through the building, getting quite disoriented, I might add. I asked my guides how I was supposed to find my way back out, or even to the restroom. An older, less severe MP answered me. We'll be there in a minute, father. As for the latrines, trust me, you want to hold it. This section was built before indoor facilities. It's Bishop. Say again? You called me father. That's an honorific for a priest. I'm a bishop. If you want to call me by anything other than my title, it's your lordship or your excellency. The MP chuckled and said, Very well then, your lordship. I nodded as we came to a rather nondescript oak door. The MP opened it and motioned me inside. They'll be waiting for you, your lordship. I was immediately assaulted by the pungent aroma of tobacco smoke as I entered. Ten men sat around a series of maps of Palestine and walls covered in all manner of occult and profane imagery, more than enough to give anyone of the cloth pause. Good, Bishop. Please, sit down. Would you like a cigarette? An aging American said demurely. I replied in the negative. I rarely partake in tobacco. It was just never really my thing. Could someone please tell me why I've been pulled from my studies and told why I've been drafted into a unit no one's ever even heard of? Can I call you Nathan or Nathaniel? The American asked. Nathan is quite acceptable, sir. Excellent. You can call me James or Jim. It's your choice, really. Okay, James. May I please have an explanation as to why I'm here? Of course. Take a seat. We'll keep it as brief as possible while hitting all the key points. Brief as it were turned out to be was two hours of what I considered absolute poppycock. The delusional ramblings of the insane were touched. Not the matter-of-fact assertions of several battle-tested officers and respected if not obscure scientific minds at the table. The gist of the issue was the Germans and Ottomans knew they were on the verge of losing the war, and some more desperate brass were seeking any way to turn that around. Some went with esoteric weapons like gases and plagues. Some looked to the dark arts, demonology and the like. Even the more open-minded among his order professed that such things were nothing more than metaphors and parables. Yet, here everyone was openly discussing such things as fact. I was shown a first encounter file. The battle for Transylvania. Fortunately, it was a route for the Central Powers, but they had attempted to capture an ancient site to summon and bind demons, in a bid to make super soldiers apparently. The site was destroyed and then the ground consecrated to prevent a reoccurrence of the issue. But the Central Powers had located another site, allegedly. This time, in the biblically charged Megiddo Valley, their governments throwing 70,000 guns and men in a gamble to hold and unlock what was alleged to be the Well of Souls. I was familiar with the legend, but not a single scrap of evidence pointed to its existence in over 6,000 years. This is when it was my turn to talk. What you're calling the Well of Souls is the inverse to the Tower of Babel in a way. Where the ancients built the tower to commune with God and thus earn desire, the well was supposedly constructed in Tel Abrim to go deep into the earth. Each level was lined with sacrificial altars, and at the nadir were allegedly eight altars surrounding the shaft to the underworld. It was all constructed to summon Nergal, the god of war, death, and scorched earth, but Nergal had never been recorded granting his favor. It's recorded that those who sought his favor outside the battlefield would never receive it. Well, this well had been the stuff of military legend with many famous conquerors seeking it, Alexander, and so on and so forth, but none ever finding it. It was assumed to be myth maybe with a smaller, more mundane basis in reality, like the Ark of the Covenant or the Holy Grail, but its purpose was definitely had to have been myth. Well, Nathan, myth or not, the Huns and Ottomans believe it enough to try. 
So send in the armies to deal with it. I don't see why you need me. Christ almighty, no wonder it's taken this long for you to deal with the Kaiser. Tell me, Colonel, are all your boys this so lily never been soft? That's quite uncalled for, General, and you damn well know it. Our lads are made of much sterner stuff than you ever gave them credit for. All right, all right. Get your knickers untwisted. I'm not serious hell. I can't believe I have to take any of this seriously. Demons, rituals, and all of that hogwash. But here we are, and here you are too, Bishop, whether we like it or not. Well, what exactly am I to do? I've never even fired a gun before, the general piped up. Well then, it's a good thing you're just going to translate for us. Unless you feel an overwhelming urge to shoot your book bag, you shouldn't even need a gun. This got quite a bit of a chuckle from the room, myself included. It was quite clever. But what? Ancient Mesopotamian, Bishop. That's why you're here. Oh, I see. But, sir, I'm not an expert, not even by any stretch. We know, Nathan. But you're the only one that we can get safely in the time required. We promise you'll be breathed further on the way. As the colonel spoke. Right then, Bishop. Leave a list of books and materials you're going to need with the MPs on your way out. You'll be taken to the local barracks to be fitted out, and then to the docks to convene with the rest of the fleet at 0900 on the morrow. At this point, I was unceremoniously rushed up and taken to the kidding location, where I was given my desert khakis, a rucksack, and a Webley revolver. This made me more uncomfortable than anything else about this. I was an avowed pacifist. I would have have to have faith that he walks with me and would guide my hand from violence. Earlier in that morning, we joined the fleet and then started steaming towards Palestine, where we would reinforce the army there, and then locate and penetrate the well and stop whatever was happening, and demolish the site if required. I always marveled with the military mindset, so clinical and detached when discussing matters of life, death, and destruction. These men made and discussed plans that would kill thousands as you and I would discuss the weather after lunch. Remarkable and maddening all at once, but I could wax philosophical about the vagaries of war another time. I kept my mind occupied absorbing all I could on Nergal, preparing myself for when I would be needed to interpret during the mission. Rest certainly didn't come easy to me during the voyage. I was a terrible Briton, having such poor constitution on the seas, but I had a sneaking suspicion that being surrounded by all these guns and weapons was setting me off more than the ocean itself. So I decided to go topside of the ship to get some air. The acrid smell of smoke and machinery was less pervasive up there. As I watched the moonlit fleet, my senses were suddenly assaulted by the sudden explosions around us. I must have looked a terrible fright, as a couple of engineers that were attached to us laughed at my expense. Relax, mate. It's outgoing. They're just dropping charges on the U-boat, shadowing the fleet. Obviously chagrined, I meekly smiled back. Sorry, lads. I, I don't often sail. It's okay, Padre. We won't let the Huns get the best of us. God save the king and all. Uh, right. Good night, lads. God be with you. Five days later, we arrived in port on September 17th. Our detachment quickly gathered our kit and pack animals and began to move out. The men the Americans called Rangers said it would be a two to three day ride to remain undetected to the site. Padre, can you carry all of that? A corporal asked me. I replied, not all of it, why? And, and please, call me Nathan uh, or Mr. Dale. I'm not a priest, I'm a bishop. Well, Nathan, not to disrespect his holiness, but out here, no one gives a goddamn toss. We all have stupid nicknames and you're going to get Padre. Second, after we break last camp... It's all on foot to the objective, so no more than you could rock for five to ten miles. I must have the world's worst poker face, because the corporal just laughed at me. Ah, Padre, don't worry about it. You'll be alright. We'll get you sorted out and make sure you get everything there. The next two days were painfully slow as we moved around the enemy, probing deep into the lines, making our way to the entrance of the well. Several times we encountered groups of nomad tribes. The corporal said to me, They'll want to watch on the periphery, capture and enslave any who break and run. They've got a special love for taking Turks. Then, they'll comb the battlefield for anything useful after the fact. I responded to the corporal that I found that most dreadful, to which the two engineers behind us looked at me and said, No, Padre, it's smart. If you're forced to be nomadic, then why not take from those who forced it upon you? I simply remarked back to the engineers that the longer we were stuck in this war, the further we seemed to fall from God's grace. And they looked back at me and quipped, Padre, you really need to lighten the hell up. Over the next two hours, we approached the site where the well's entrance was located. There was a few motor trucks hidden behind the ruined buildings, covered in cam nets. But there seemed to be no guards, no sentries, nothing at all. Something felt deeply off about all of this. The colonel left the Lewis and signal seams by the entrance, as we prepared to make ours. We started down the rock-hewn steps inside the temple proper, when we barely got ten feet down the first flight before we had to put on our torches. 
We continued to descend for what seemed like 20 minutes, and by any reckoning, we must have been several hundred meters underground by now. But at the bottom, a single shaft led south according to the compass. Two and a half men could walk abreast in a ceiling barely seven feet tall as we walked down it. After we walked maybe 75 feet, it was more than clear that this wasn't some recent construction, nor a minor ruin either. We saw what looked to be a corner coming up, and maybe voices. A lot of voices. We stopped dead in our tracks. A corporal ran his torch across the floor. There must be more than 30 different boots and footprints in the dust here. Some are barefoot, maybe a shuffled gate chained up or hobbled maybe. We quietly snuck up on the next entrance. Astonishing would have been underselling what we saw by several orders of magnitude. As we snuck toward the entrance, we could see it was massive. It must have been at least 50 to 75 meters across, circular with altars hewn from the same rock as the well was carved from, all equidistant around the perimeter. As soon as we snuck closer, we could see fresh offerings on each altar. Cages of snakes, scorpions, desert rats, and at least 15 levels descended down toward his bottom, all with altars on them. A rank odor began wafting up that set my stomach on edge. As we peered back over the edge, every altar all the way down either had a living or dead creature or person in various states of dismemberment. I scrambled back to the entrance we came in and vomited. At that moment, we were all eternally grateful the enemy was being particularly noisy. The ground began to shake. The corporal said to me, It's okay, Padre. It's just artillery. Probably ours. Cutting off the reinforcements. I wiped the spittle from my mouth and began to take notice of the doorway. The carvings in it. I gathered my wits and began to interpret them. My eyes widened in panic. We need to stop this now, or everyone is going to die. The soldiers began to unsafe their rifles and pistols. No, no bloodshed, or as little as possible. All those who shed blood in this place are bound to him eternally. To kill here damns your immortal souls. The scouts shuffled up beside us. We outnumber them, but not by much. We count maybe ten active combatants. The soldiers began to all pull billy clubs from their belts. Okay, Padre, we trust you. This is why we brought you along. It's your thing, after all. The colonel pulled off his bandolier and began to pull the pins on three grenades. Relax, it's just smoke, so they can't see us. And then he tossed the bandolier into the well. This alerted the enemy fully to our presence, and a few shots began to rang out. You could hear a voice in German yell to give him time as began his incantations. We have to hurry, I yelled over the dead as the two engineers helped me to free the captives. By the grace of God, those we freed did not run, but helped free the others while others jumped into the fray to assist their liberators. I was truly heartened. As I was unchaining a young Turkish boy, a stray bullet struck him in the abdomen. I strained to staunch the bleeding and help him, as the din hit a crescendo, and then everything just stopped as we were all turned off. A deep rumble from the shaft at the lectern bellowed out. All of the injured and sacrifices began to levitate in the air. A great tearing noise reverberated through the well as they were all disassembled and levitated to the center and began to weave together to something, an abomination against God. The German went prostate for ten whole seconds before being rended apart to make the head of the demon, and it spoke. Simple creatures of flesh and spirit, you do not learn. I screamed back, Silence, demon! You hold no sway over us! Ah. Uh. A child of Abraham. So naive, so foolish. You think your upstart god is the only one? Your lies are the purview of demons and the fallen, and by the power and grace of Almighty God, I will send you back to hell where you belong. I had no idea where I was finding this confidence, this power, but I leaned into it. By his grace, I am his instrument. By his word, I bind you. Nurgle's avatar laughed, and a force pulled me to him. Stupid child, your words mean nothing, and you can no more command me than you would the tide. I cannot take you because you are pure and unblooded, but do not think you will escape my ire. These failed warriors are mine. The innocent are yours, and I will leave. That is the arrangement. The smell of rot was overpowering as I saw the soldiers leading the captives away. I shot back. What will happen to them? You. I have already consumed their souls, whelp, and this is only an avatar. The rot began to grow worse as Nurgal's avatar began to demanifest. He reached out a bone-hued claw and muttered something I didn't understand, and then my chest burned. Above my heart, 
A symbol appeared, and it kept changing, morphing. For your arrogance, I will curse you with life eternal. You will never see his false grace or know his touch. And one day, you will shed blood. Then, child, I will devour your soul too. As the last word echoed out of the avatar, he demanifested, spilling awful everywhere, and I blacked out. When I came to, I was in a hospital bed. The nurse looked at me softly and said, It's okay. You're safe. This is the RMS Aquitania. The, the others, I whispered back in a hoarse voice as she handed me a glass of water. All but three made it, Nathan, a gruff American voice said. General, I tried to sit up. No, lay down, please. We lost the engineers on the escape. The charges detonated early, but you saved 25 civilians, Nathan. Tears flowed from my eyes as I remembered the young men who, without hesitation, helped stop the demon Nergal. I said a silent prayer for their salvation and souls. The general spoke back up. The only thing we found in your effects was his cloth wrapped Bible. It's in remarkable shape given the circumstances. Anyways, Bishop, thank you. Recover well, and we'll see you back in London. Looking at him slightly confused, I opened the gilded book. It wasn't mine or anything I owned. But the inscription said no language I recognized, but one that nonetheless I could still read. No servant of darkness can claim that which does not belong to him. You are his instrument, Nathaniel, of the faith. You bear his mark, and with these words you'll be armored. His will be done. I am Bishop Nathaniel Dale, immortal agent of our Lord God, and in the coming years I would have much to discover. But as it is written, his will be done.